Hello, welcome to GNN, a weekly Fallout-themed podcast brought to you by ShoddyCast, makers of Hidden History and Fallout lore, The Storyteller. I'm your host, Charles Battersby, and with me is my co-host... Austin Horrigan, the decidedly less intelligent and less well-read co-host. Austin is being very humble. (laughs) And now, it's been a slow news week uh, in terms of new Fallout stuff that's come out of Bethesda. They saved all the good stuff up for QuakeCon, and there really hasn't been anything spectacular that we've learned in the last weeks since we did the podcast. So we're going to leap right into... A uh, segment that we call artsy smartsy stuff. This is where we look at the literary and film influences behind the Fallout games. We're going to look at a series of short stories that were adapted into a film and into a comic book. A Boy and His Dog. And these are a major influence on uh, the Fallout series, both its tone and a lot of the uh, concepts for what things might be like in a post-apocalyptic world. So for those of you who haven't heard, A Boy and His Dog is best known by the film adaptation that starred a young Don Johnson as a teenage boy wandering a post-apocalyptic world with his telepathic dog sidekick. So uh, the boy is named Vic, sometimes called Albert by his smart alecky dog, Blood. And in the movie, uh, the dog was voiced. Uh, you could hear the two of them talking. Uh, the dog was done through a voiceover, uh, not a little you know, dog moving its uh, lips, uh, chewing peanut butter or anything. <laughs> so that was a great directorial choice. Uh, and so most of it is essentially Don Johnson walking around a post-apocalyptic desert talking to himself. Um, but before it was adapted into a film in 1975, it was a short story written by Harlan Ellison, who's one of the, the greats of science fiction and of uh, gritty, misanthropic, um, downer science fiction. He uh, also did another thing called I have no mouth and I must scream, which was uh, directly adapted into a video game back in the days of uh, adventure games when they were in their heyday. And Ellison went on to write a couple of uh, additional short stories about these characters. One is a prequel that shows young Vic and Blood before they went on their their grand adventure from the main story. And then uh, after the movie developed a, a controversial Um, response from people who didn't like a certain plot twist at the end, Ellison wrote a uh, conclusion that's set shortly afterwards that uh, uh, allows Vic to explore the psychological ramifications of the twist that we will try not to blow. So, Austin, what do you think of this movie? I think, especially as as a Fallout influence, it's, I, I have not read the books, but you get like the feeling the instant you turn it. By the way, if you want to watch it, it's on YouTube. You can just go on YouTube, search for a boy and his dog, and the whole movie is on YouTube, and you can you can watch it there for free. I don't know <laughs> how legal that is, but they haven't taken it down yet, so it must uh, maybe it's in some sort of weird public domain or or something. I, I don't really know, but it's the the instant you watch it, you you get the feeling of where Fallout got their influences there's just this kind of effervescent ever-present tone of kind of this the downer feeling of it yet also that that kind of um there's a bit of comedy to it right away which is basically the kind of almost ridiculousness of the telepathic dog existing and being significantly more intelligent than than his human counterpart (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, that's a core theme to it, that uh, Don Johnson, as a teenage boy raised in this wasteland, has no concept of morality and ethics and law. And he's a serial rapist and a murderer who kills people, rapes women, steals what he needs to survive. The dog, Blood, is uh, arguably the smartest living thing in the world. Uh, he's very well educated. He's much smarter than uh, the average human. And... Uh, uh, t- compared to him, Vic is essentially this feral little pet that he keeps around <laughs> because he has thumbs and can work the guns. And and the, the d- d- there's a lot of direct references to a boy and his dog in Fallout. For one thing, uh, Vic, the main character, will refer to uh, Blood the dog as dog meat to insult him. So I mean, there's a, there you go already with uh, there's a is it was it Fallout Three that started with the dog meat thing? 
Um, he was dog meat right from the beginning. Okay, so see, it's from from the get go. You had you had the uh, dog meat as reference. Um, also, it, er, an early on quote, so it's not really revealing anything. The dog kind of says offhandedly, "Ah, war is hell," and it it has that feeling of the you know the war never changes attitude. Uh, even though even though blood doesn't say that directly, that's the conveying the same message. Like this added like uh, war is you know. It's crappy, you know, like every war. And one of the the very obvious references is halfway through the movie, Vic goes to uh, see an underground shelter where people have survived the apocalypse. And uh, the down-unders, as they call them, are a lot like the vault Tech vaults. The one that he goes to, uh, deep beneath the earth, there's a recreation of a wholesome little small town, a, uh, a Norman Rockwell all-American town, but it's underground, and there's still streets and lawns and fake trees, and people dress in these uh, little, you know, county fair Sunday best outfits with their faces painted white and big rosy cheeks put on them. And of course, it's all underground. So this creates, it. first, it's comical on one level while also being creepy that people have chosen to try to hold on to this past in a way that uh, that it, it's no longer relevant. You know, the artificial trees, the artificial gardens and parks are something that there's no rational reason to have it. And the nostalgia for it is, of course, lost on the generation that's growing up in this town. And that's a lot like a uh, fiendish vault tech experiment that you might see <laughs> in one of the in one of the later interpretations of the vault tech vaults. And this was all adapted into a comic book as well uh, around 2003, I think it was published. Uh, so there are volumes out there that include uh, the original short story plus the two uh, additional short stories, uh, fully adapted comic book version, as well as illustrations that accompany the non-comic text. So if you can find one of those particular volumes that has all of it wrapped together in one package, uh, then you are highly encouraged to go out and grab it. And in fact, Harlan Ellison himself, uh, uh, Harlan Ellison is a uh, lovable curmudgeon, we'll say. <laughs> and his forward to the comic book edition is read the text first, then look at the pictures. All right, so now we're going to begin a new weekly segment, the Mod Showcase. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about the possibility of having vehicles in Fallout 4, and I rather smugly insisted that every vehicle mod I've played in uh, Fallout 3 or Fallout New Vegas, it just felt like I was wearing a truck as a hat and running around. Uh, and a bunch of people pointed out in the comments that there's something called XRE Cars! Exclamation point. So I tried it a little while ago, and yes, this is a uh, terrific mod. The cars actually function like cars. Uh, there's physics behind them. It's not like you're just you know wearing a motorcycle as a pair of pants and then running around. Uh, and the people that made it also recommend a couple of other mods for you to put in that will help uh, avoid the sense that your you know truck hat is constantly crashing into plants. Uh, so, uh, Austin, what are your experiences with XRE cars? I played it for about 45 minutes today, um, and you know, it, it was surprisingly good. It wasn't, it wasn't like, it wasn't as good as a game that was built around the concept of driving. But for modding the Bethesda engine, and it does, um, when you start it up, it actually gives you this little dialogue box that says, hey, um, you gotta click OK on this dialogue box, and then we're gonna change the physics engine a little bit. Um, so this runs a little better, and uh, then you can start it up again. So it actually does tweak the default Bethesda engine a bit. It is a bit of a challenge to drive cars in the wasteland, as I suppose it probably should be. Um, but it was it was way better than other mods that I had seen before it, and and and, be, and actually it was because of the original car mods that I decided that I was like gonna go all vanilla all the time, and hardly played any mods at all. Um, so that was really refreshing given my previous experience with car mods. Actually, the background footage for this podcast is going to involve a bit of driving in dust, the mod that we talked about last week. Um, which I also don't recommend. It kind of breaks the feeling of dust, but it's also kind of fun to run over ghouls. Thing things glitch a little when you run them over. The game still is not designed with that in mind. Um, but you know, 
It does a little damage. You can kill them some uh, if you're lucky, but it's 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 a remarkably well done mod. Like it's, I, I imagine a lot of work went into getting it uh, operating correctly. Uh, yeah, and this is not just you install the mod and then there's, you know, a car sitting there and you get in the car and drive around. There's a, a bunch of cars placed around the world uh, in the hands of merchants who have to buy the car keys from the merchants. Um, and you're told right at the beginning where one particular truck is right in Good Springs. So uh, it's easy to find the first truck. Then you've got to drive around to other likely places in the wasteland where, you know, they might sell cars. So other big towns will have them. And there's one really notable location, which is uh, Rex's car shop, where you can go in and it's like an auto dealership where there's there's a little storyline. Uh, there's a fully voiced uh, shopkeeper inside there, um, voiced by a, another YouTube celebrity that does uh, Fallout videos. And you can go in and you can buy cars. There's uh, a big selection there. So uh, there's this racetrack where you can go and you can drive the Brahmin cross country track, which will put a series of markers uh, all over the wasteland that you have to drive around and try to make the best time. So it's more than just, hey, here's a truck, go drive it. You have fully voiced characters and economic structure. Uh, you have things waiting to surprise you around the wasteland. And you have something specific to do with your cars and in driving the uh, Brahmin cross country. So uh, a few things that um, I didn't like about this mod uh, is that the game just isn't built for having this. So there are a lot of places you can't drive. And uh, if you install this mod when you're just doing the main storyline, it's going to be very hard for you to drive from town to town uh, pursuing the storyline in your truck just because you, you're not going to be able to, you know, to get to certain places along the most direct route. All right, and now if you do like the idea of roaming around a post-apocalyptic wasteland in a vehicle and getting out and shooting people, there's a game that's kind of like Fallout called Rage. So we're going to tie in our weekly mod showcased with uh, another feature called Games That Aren't Fallout. And this week we're going to look at Rage, which does have cars and it's set in a Fallout universe. It was published by Bethesda and was developed by id Software, who I'm, I'm sure you all know make the Doom games. And so Rage is, I think if another company had tried to make this game, Bethesda would have just sued the hell out of them because the Fallout references in Rage are utterly blatant. Your character emerges in a post-apocalyptic world from an arc, not a vault. So you've been cryogenically <laughs> unfrozen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's a pretty shameless uh, reference that, you know, these arcs are almost exactly like Fallout's vaults. And as soon as they emerge from not a vault. <laughs> yeah, they might as well have just called it that. It's the schmalt tech schmalt. <laughs> so you come out of your schmalt uh, and immediately John Goodman from Roseanne <laughs> voices uh, the first character you meet. And so throughout the entire uh, introductory, uh, you know, quest, hub, you're going to be thinking, that guy sounds like John Goodman. And it is John Goodman doing the voice. So he does a really deep redneck voice and he drives you back to his little town and tells you that, you know, you've come from the schmalt and the apocalypse is struck and uh, now you're a special person that's got to go out and save the wasteland. At warp the schmaced land. We don't want to trample on anyone's copyright there. <laughs> All right, but the, the premise is, is pretty simple. Uh, there's first person shooter mechanics, just like you'd expect from id, but getting from one level to the next, you drive a car through the wasteland and you start out with a little ATV, then you get a little dune buggy and then you get a series of better and more powerful vehicles. And uh, it's divided into some you know pretty cleanly divided segments. You have your, your shooting when you get to the pace, your driving uh, segments when you're getting from one quest hub to the location for the base. Uh, and then they have, all right, so there's a mini game within Rage called Mutant Bash TV, where you can be a contestant on a game show that has you fight off wave after wave of mutants with your guns. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, so that you know that's a real you know 
clearly segmented uh, part of the game where you can just drive to the Mutant TV studio and participate in a, a series of these, uh, you know, arena combat sequences. Then elsewhere, there's a racetrack and you can uh, only upgrade your vehicles by earning special upgrades through participating in the races. So when you get to one particular quest hub, you can go in these races and then uh, use the vehicles that you've already unlocked to unlock even better vehicles and more upgrades. So it's all it's all very clearly defined as to what you're going to be doing. Uh, not so much a free roaming wasteland, uh, because if you do get out of your car and walk around, there's going to be long stretches of nothing. Uh, and that kind of gets back to the concept that Fallout 3 and New Vegas aren't really designed for vehicles. They're designed for you to run down the road and constantly see interesting little things to go and interact with. Rage, on the other hand, is designed for you to have long driving sequences with vehicular combat between towns. It also seems like id was trying to uh, expand their gameplay with this because they try to um, put in some crafting elements as well. You can build specialty ammunition for your guns, you can build different kinds of gadgets uh, that'll help you explore the levels, like a lock grinder that lets you access certain doors that aren't available unless you have the crafting tools for it. Uh, and you can get really cool ammo for your guns that's rare within the real world, but you can you know make it yourself if you like that particular gun. So it's it's not just a mindless shooter. They were really trying to put in some aspects of uh, you know a crafting system that, that's a little fancier than what you would normally find in, in a mindless shooting game. Alright, so if there's a game that reminds you of Fallout that you'd like to discuss, or a mod that you think deserves more attention, uh, give us a notice either by Twitter or in the comments right below the video, because uh, we're going to be doing mod showcase and games that are kind of like Fallout every week. <laughs> Alright, so another game that's kind of like Fallout that's coming out soon is the Mad Max game. This is the game adaptation of Fury Road, and this is going to be more than a little like Fallout. So, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> so a couple of weeks ago, we pointed out that uh, Fallout fans who don't watch Mad Max, uh, they make the developers cry, you're, uh, you know, you really should see these games, and it turned out that after making fun of one person who said that they never watched uh, Mad Max, a whole bunch of other people commented in the comments on last week's uh, podcast and said that they've never uh, seen Mad Max either. So we're going to talk a little bit uh, in depth about how the Mad Max series influenced Fallout. So Austin, you did a Mad Max-centered episode of Hidden History. I did! And um, actually, um, Graham Blackaby wrote it, and uh, that was my second my second video that I, ed that I voiced. Um, but I'm a huge Mad Max fan, and right before um, editing that video, I actually re-watched the original three because I don't think Fury Road was out when I edited it, which also is amazing. And it, it is, it just scratches the surface of the, uh, the number of Mad Max references that are actually in the Fallout series. Uh, obviously, um, there's the kind of the 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 theme of him having a dog companion that's that's common obviously a, a, we just talked about a boy and his dog uh, earlier today and and so he's th that that's probably where the original concept came from the post apocalyptic uh canine companion though also um um i am legend also had had it that seems to be like a thing that 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 writers just want it's like if i'm in apocalypse i need a dog I need it with me. It's such a great idea. I don't want other people. I just want my cute little dog. And, and in the first Fallout, though, there's a very specific Mad Max reference to it. There is. Uh, when you show up to a quiet... Well, you show up, and this guy's getting... Like, his house is being guarded by this dog. It's not his dog. It's like he can't get into his own house. And uh, you're tasked with uh, getting rid of the dog. Um, and he describes the owner of the dog as being someone who had... Uh, who was tall and had dark hair with graying around the temples and and that he uh, had a weird accent. And uh, there was another one. I can't remember what, oh, he was wearing all black leather, which is a reference to the the way that Mel Gibson's uh, Max dressed in at least the first two. I can't remember uh, if he wore the leather ensemble in, in the third Mad Max movie, but he definitely did in the first two movies. And uh, it's a reference, and it's a, a very definite reference to uh, uh, 
the Mad Max uh, canine companion from from uh, Road Warrior. And for those of you who haven't played the first Fallout yet, there's a, it, I don't know if it's a bug, but it's something that's very inconvenient. If you happen to wear the leather armor when you walk through Junktown, you will automatically get and complete this quest without knowing what the hell happened. So uh, wh- when you go to <laughs> Junktown, make sure you take off your leather jacket that you acquired in Vault 15. I think it's not a bug because... Um the the leather armor the leather armor itself is very closely modeled after Max's leather outfit, um, but it's not super well explained <laughs> in the, in the in the first game. And if you wear the leather outfit onto that map, uh, you won't even get the NPCs referencing, hey, the guy used to own a, this dog, he had a leather jacket. You know, you'll just immediately walk on and the dog will start following you around and you, you won't have any references to why he's doing it. Oh, um, there's the random encounter in Fallout 3. You, you meet a guy named Mel who whose gun is empty. Oh, that's right! That's the one that... On that episode, everyone said that. They're like, there's this random encounter in Fallout 3 where you there's a guy with leather armor named Mel who has a sawn-off shotgun, which is his is Max's iconic weapon. He's had it in every single movie. Um, it also frequently misfires in every single movie, too. Yes. I think the gag in the random encounter is that his gun is empty. And, well, spoiler alert, an empty shotgun has something to do with uh, Road Warrior. So those of you who've been listening to GNN a lot know that every now and then I'll make references to a Giddy Up Buttercup TV show that we have here on GNN or other references to robot ponies. Uh, And someone made a comment last week about they think that I might be a brony. And although I'm not, uh, although I'm not a brony, I have seen a few episodes of My Little Pony, Friendship is Magic, and I understand why grown-ups would watch it. But it turns out that the Giddy Up Buttercup references in the Fallout games are not actually My Little Pony or uh, brony references at all. The uh, Giddy Up Buttercup um, robot ponies were in Fallout 3 right at the beginning, and they were featured in the Mothership Zeta DLC, which came out in 2009. Um, Now, for those of you who follow uh, My Little Pony, um, My Little Pony had the reboot called Friendship is Magic, which came out in 2010, and that's the point where the adult fans of My Little Pony and the male fans, the bronies, started to happen, but Uh, Giddy Up Buttercup and the references to pony-loving aliens were actually a year ahead of Friendship is Magic. So I think that someone at Bethesda is a longtime old-school fan of the My Little Pony franchise, probably back in the 80s, and they grew up playing with My Little Pony and decided, you know, I'm going to put robot horses in this game, and I'm going to create a race of malevolent aliens that love a little girl's story about the robot ponies. Um, so for those of you who've been wondering about that, uh, actually Bethesda had their, uh, their thumb on the pulse of this phenomenon before it even existed. So whoever put these references in did them very, uh, you know, very subtly so that it's just left to the audience's imagination. And then a year later, suddenly the the brony phenomenon occurs. All right, and so for those of you who um, uh, are My Little Pony fans, um, there is a fan fiction mashup called Fallout Equestria, which it sounds crazy, but it's My Little Ponies after the apocalypse. Uh, so it, it's a long running, uh, highly regarded fan fiction. So uh, if you've enjoyed my uh, giddy up buttercup jokes here on the show, uh, you might want to check out Fallout Equestria. Uh, and also, something else that stood out to me about the E3 conference was that when Todd Howard was talking about the different things that you can disassemble to make crafting components, one of the things he specifically pointed out was that you'll be able to disassemble the Giddy Up Buttercup. <laughs> so I think <laughs> it's like of all the things to pick, it's not the Radiation King radio, it's not any of the other junk, the Red Rider BB guns. He's got to point out that it's the Giddy Up Buttercup. So 
I think Bethesda is aware of the cross-pollination of pony fandom, uh, and they probably have some authentic, long-time My Little Pony fans at Bethesda. So I wouldn't be surprised if we saw more of Giddy Up Buttercup in Fallout 4. And now, here's a few words from our sponsors, Nuka-Cola. And now, this slave has proven willing to kill and die for his freedom. But how will he fare against the last man who made it all the way? Gruber! Undefeated in the hole, Gruber has yet to meet his match. Only one will walk out with their freedom. Only one will walk out alive. Go! I'm gonna kill ya! And there's only one left standing! Only one! Oh, my friends, what a fantastic fight! Hey, Mr. Gruber? M Mr. Gruber? Yeah? I... I just wanted you to know, well, you're the greatest pit fighter ever. Uh-huh. Do you... Do you want some of my Nuka-Cola? It's okay. You can have it. Well, see you around. Hey, kid. Catch. Welcome back. Now it's time for viewer questions. Our first viewer question comes from Robert Stone on Twitter. Why aren't there any ghoul kids in Fallout? Mmm. Ah. Well, I have a theory. Uh-huh. Okay, let's hear your theory. Well, I, I, the, only, the only real theory I can come up with is that the immune system of a child is not strong enough to handle the forces of 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 radiation and mutation, uh, that I mean, it, not every adult human can become a ghoul uh, under under the the proper conditions. And I think, if, like, if I were to put a guess on, it, I'm not sure if it's ever been addressed in the actual in the actual lore of the game. Um, but I just my theory would be that there's no way that a child would be able to handle the process. So I, I have noticed that ghoulification is handled differently depending on who's writing the game or who's writing the mission. So we've, uh, we do have a father-son ghoul team in the games um, set. Uh, the leader of the original group of ghouls in um, Necropolis in the first game, Set, he has a adult son who appears in Fallout 2. Uh, and that character was apparently an adult before he ghoulified. Uh, so we... Um, we haven't actually seen a child ghoul. We don't know if they might grow up. Maybe that's why we don't see any child ghouls, because, you know, they just grow up after they become ghouls, and they're all, you know, or hypothetically, they can all be, you know, very old. Uh, and secondly, we've sometimes been told that ghoulification happens over a period of years. So maybe a child ghoul starts ghoulifying, and then they're, you know, they look like an adult by the time they've ghoulified. But also, there are a few people who've ghoulified quickly. We all remember, uh, well, if you're negative karma, you can blow up Megaton and turn a certain character into a ghoul. <laughs> <laughs> Which just happens instantaneously. There's also uh, Camp Searchlight in, in uh, Fallout New Vegas that uh, the, the Legion set off a dirty bomb and, and with and it seems to be a surprise to everyone uh, that it's happened. Like, you're one of the first people to know about it, and there are ghouls there already. So the, that group transformed quickly. Yeah, so I think the, well. the answer to the question, why are there no, no ghoul kids in Fallout, is because they haven't written a story about that yet. 
Now, speaking of speculations, uh, in the past we've done irresponsible speculations, but people have been suggesting things that actually are pretty good ideas. All right, so from now on, we're going to compile the perfectly reasonable speculations into a new segment. And this week, we're going to start perfectly reasonable speculations with Hannibal Hawkwing writes, I think it's very possible that ghoulification could be a perk in Fallout 4. And ah! I agree. I We've heard that, you know, perks will have several different levels. We know that ghoulification happens as a slow process. So I, I do think it's perfectly reasonable that in Fallout 4 or a DLC pack, you'll get a perk where you're, you know, first stage ghoulification and you slowly ghoulify a little more with each level that you take of it. Austin? I think this is especially cool because I have looked and if and a few viewers have, have found mods that you're particularly fond of, do point them out to me. But the ones that I looked for for ghoulification in Fallout 3 New Vegas were a little, I eh, didn't really like him too much. I really, because I like the idea of playing a ghoul and then having it be an organic, like where you have radiation poisoning. Because, I mean, they always talk about it as a threat, but it's never anything that actually happens to you. And I like the idea. I like, like you know, and then it would have some benefits, like maybe increased endurance, but way lower uh, charisma. Um, I, I love the idea. I do. I, I think that'd be a heck of a lot of fun to do that. Okay, and now that the disclaimers are done, let's go on to irresponsible speculations. <laughs> okay, here, here's a doozy. Um, Griffin Hearted on YouTube writes, One of the locations you can build a settlement in is an underground vault, meaning you can play Fallout Shelter. <laughs> You'll be able to... Ah, ah, but wait, 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 wait. He's got like a, he's got like a loop here going. He's got like the golden spiral, uh, a Mobius strip, perhaps. <laughs> you will also find a game cartridge for your Pip-Boy that's a retro-style version of Fallout Shelter. You'll be able to sit in your Fallout Shelter settlement and be able to play Fallout Shelter while you play Fallout Shelter in Fallout 4. Yo, dog, I heard you like Fallout Shelter, so like put a Fallout in your Fallout so you can fall out while you fall out. <laughs> oh, well, here's the real thing you got to do. While you're playing Fallout 4, you got to take your computer down into your basement and tape up all the windows, <laughs> nail the door shut. Then you'll be in a Fallout shelter, playing Fallout 4, where you'll build another Fallout shelter and then put virtual Fallout shelter on your Pip-Boy. All right, so our final irresponsible speculation is Jonah Jingle on Twitter writes, Hey, I just thought after Brian T. Delaney was on ham radio, maybe you guys could invite the femme protagonist to GNN. Hmm, that's an interesting idea. That's something I, we maybe uh, having some sort of special guest on in the very near future. Maybe that's something uh, we could work maybe. out there. Um, maybe. Maybe. I, I, I think people who... Uh, you know, like this particular irresponsible speculation, might want to keep an eye on the uh, shoddy cast feeds in the near future because there's there's a slight chance that perhaps something akin to what was suggested here just may happen in the surprisingly near future. I'm just gonna tape up a picture of Courtney Taylor. I printed off my printer. <laughs> Take a photo of it. She's gonna listen to this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> She's going to listen to this. Brian Delaney is going to listen to this. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> nothing creepy. Damn it. This was our one week to sound like professionals. And look what we've done. We've revealed our true selves yet again. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <sighs> but we did get through the whole episode without any references to cannibalism or bestiality. Barely. I might add. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. And in all seriousness, please do keep an eye on ShoddyCast's social media feeds because we will be having some special guests on the show in the very near future. And of course, if you have an irrational speculation, a perfectly reasonable speculation, a viewer question, or if there is a mod, a game, or an artsy smartsy thing you'd like us to discuss, please let us know in the comments below or on Twitter. I'm Charles Batters B with no Y on the end. And I'm A.R. Horrigan, which I'll put on the screen because you can't spell it. All right. And you can catch us here every Thursday. There are new episodes of Shoddy Cast's uh, Fallout Lore, The Storyteller, every Friday. And you can catch uh, new episodes of Giddy Up Buttercup and the Pony Pals every weekday afternoon after school.